Other questions? All right. So in order to kind of <coughs> bring home what all this means, Hatter has this example of the sheep. All right? It's a very famous example that he goes through. I'm going to go through it carefully because it's so crucial to the way he's understanding what's going on. <coughs> so he says, let that lamb there as an image pass by under his eyes. It is to him as it is to no other animal. So he's saying, okay, humans looking at a sheep, it's very different than all these other animals looking at the sheep. Not as it would appear to the hungry scenting wolf, not it as it would appear to the blood lapping lion. They scent and taste in anticipation. Right? So this is the example of the predator that looks at the lamb and says, oh, I'm going to eat that lamb. Right? There's, no, there's no reflection here. There's just seeing the lamb, you're going to go after it. Sensuousness has overwhelmed them. Instinct forces them to throw themselves over it. Right? And so, so this, is, this is the first reason. He says, you know, the, the claim here is the animals look at the sheep. I mean, he doesn't really state, state the claim as such here, but clearly animals look at the sheep through the lens of instinct. I mean, that's really overall what he's saying. Right? And he says, in this first instance, some animals focus attention on the lamb because they are, are instinctively drawn to it, right? first as the predator. And then he has the second example, not as it appears to the rutting ram, which feels it only as the object of its pleasure, which thus again is overcome by sensuousness, and which again is forced by instinct to throw itself over it. Right? So this is the second example. The, 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 the ram that has this instinct for reproduction is also going to be drawn to the, to the sheep. And again, this is the second example of that same reason. He repeats the reason um, twice. Right? So some animals focus attention on the lamb because they're instinctively drawn to it. And then he, he, th then he moves to his second reason. He says, not as it appears to any other animal to which the sheep is indifferent and which therefore lets it clearly darkly pass by because its instinct makes it turn towards something else. So this is the other example. There are some animals you know, say, uh, that, that have nothing to do with the sheep. So uh, you know, maybe some birds, right? That they don't, have any, they don't care about the sheep at all. There's neither here nor there. So they don't actually even really perceive the sheep. They just let it pass by darkly. There's, there's no real perception of the sheep at all going on in these, you know, these, you know, it's, I don't know birds. I, I don't know if birds have anything to do with sheep, but it, I assume they don't have much to do with them. In any, any case, he's, he's imagining these types of creatures that have nothing to do with the sheep and have therefore no senses or instincts that would alert them to the presence of the sheep. And so these are the two types of animal reactions to the sheep that are either there's this instinct and senses that are really focused on the sheep. Whenever they see the sheep, they, they know exactly what they, they need to do, or they, they're, they're driven to do that. Or they actually don't even see the sheep at all. They don't perceive the sheep at all. In contrast, then, humans, they're able then to perceive the sheep without any particular instinctual need or desire that's connected with the sheep. But in order to do this, they need to have these distinguishing marks. So he says, not so with man. As soon as he feels the need to come to know the sheep, no instinct gets in his way. No one sense of his pulls him too close to it or too far away from it. It stands there entirely as it manifests itself in his senses, white, soft, woolly. His soul in reflective exercise seeks a distinguishing mark. The sheep bleats. His soul has found the distinguishing mark. Right? So this is the moment. Right? He says that because no instinct gets in the way of human perception, there's nothing that's naturally pulling perception toward it or away from it. And there's, there's no actual hook in order for humans to actually even to then perceive the sheep. So in order to perceive the sheep, they need some other yeah, I guess hook, some handle by which they can sort of attach to the sheep in order to really then perceive it. So he says, humans need this distinguishing mark. The sheep bleats. His soul has found the distinguishing mark. The inner sense is at work. This bleeding, which makes upon man's soul the strongest impression, which broke away from all the other qualities of vision and of touch, which sprang out and penetrated most deeply, the soul retains it. So he's saying that this bleeding, I mean, he's, he's calling the bleeding somehow the distinguishing mark that draws human attention to the sheep in this moment. And it's, it's the, 
distinguishing mark that allows then the human to set priorities in their perceptual field. And so that's the overall claim is that, that humans need these distinguishing marks to set priorities for focusing their attention. But what he continues to say here is that it's not, it's not enough just to have this, or how, I guess what he's, what he's indicating, how does this distinguishing mark appear? Where does it come from? And he says here, the sheep comes again. So it, the sheep comes once, but that's not enough. It has to come again. The sheep comes again, white, soft, woolly. The soul sees, touches, remembers, seeks a distinguishing mark. The sheep bleats, and the soul recognizes it. And it feels inside, yes, you are that which bleats. It has recognized it humanly when it recognized and named it clearly, that is, with a distinguishing mark. What's key here is that the sheep has to come twice. It can't just come once. It just comes once. You're, you're not able to set up the mark. You need to have this moment of connecting this past experience to the present experience, which is to say you need to turn that mark into a general category. How do you turn it into a general category? You have to, you have to link it to two instances under, which, under that, that general category. If you only have one instance, then it's like the, you recall the proper noun that Hobbes talked about, which is not a universal. You have to have a common noun in order to have a universal, in order to have a category of things instead of just particular experiences. Right? And so Hatter is echoing this, this need when he says that you don't have the distinguishing mark until the sheep comes again <coughs> and you're able to link the present experience to the past experience through something distinctive, and he's calling the bleeding the distinctive thing, and he's using that as the distinguishing mark that links the past experience to the present experience in this mark that's going to be the category that will encompass both. Reasons. He says, more darkly, in that case it would have not have perceived it at all because no sensuousness, no instinct relative to the sheep could replace it for it, the lack of distinctiveness with a more vivid clarity. Right? So if there's no reduction of the sheep to a distinct category, there would be no perception, he's saying. Right? You need these categories in order to really even be able to perceive the sheep as a separate thing. Otherwise, it would just sort of, you know, I guess you, what you would imagine is that the first time the sheep came by, you wouldn't have actually noticed it as a separate thing. It would have just been something else in the background that you didn't notice. And it's only when the in that second coming of the sheep that you actually then notice that it's a thing that in which you recall that relationship to the, to the first experience. That's a reason, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm calling that a reason because it's really kind of a, it's a, um, a, it's kind of a logical argument for why you need to connect the present with the past experience. The next section I'm calling an evidence, but it's, you know, you know Hatter's reasons and evidence, they kind of uh, they kind of merge with each other in a sense. Because a lot of his reasons are, are things that we kind of kind of we have to kind of imagine in our mind, like imagining that infant in our mind. I, it, is, it, is, it is evidence, it's something that he's pointing to, but it is something that's not really like, you know, it's not something experimental, it's not something like he's actually pointing to a real infant so much, but, but it's, he's pointing to something that we can imagine in our minds, and that's what he's doing in this next part. Distinctly and directly, but without his dis distinguishing mark, in that way no, sensuousness be no sensuous being can perceive outside itself, for there are forever other feelings which it must repress, annihilate, as it were, in order to recognize as it forever must. So here he's saying that without the distinguishing mark, the mind would be unable to focus tension because its impulses need to be suppressed in order to focus this attention. Because we've got so many sensations, so many feelings and perceptions that are flooding us. And this is kind of where he's pointing to evidence in a sense. I mean, he's kind of asking us to say, oh, think about your own experience of the world. There's just so many things out there that could grab your attention how would you choose amongst all these impressions in order to then focus on one thing? And so it's, it's sort of like evidence, it's sort of like a reason. Uh, it's kind of almost a merging of the two, but it, it does ask us, to the extent that it is asking us to sort of look at our own psychology, 
it is a kind of evidence that he's pointing to at this point. And, and it's the evidence <coughs> that, that's indicating that we do need this distinguishing mark in order to then perceive anything as a separate object. And then finally he says the difference between one and another through a third, right? And so this is this strange phrase where he says we need this third. It's not exactly clear what the third is or what it's mediating between. I guess you could say that it's, you know, on one hand you could say, well, it's, it's the third that mediates between yourself and the outside world. You could also say that it's the third that mediates between the past experience and the present experience as the, the bridge between the two that creates the category that links the two. In any case, he's really, he's focused on this idea of the third as the distinguishing mark as the third that's necessary that can mediate betwe between either past and present or, or self and, and environment. In any case, he's, he's, he's focused on the third as really the, the mark, as the kind of word that functions then as the distinguishing marks for reflection, right? So that's then the next piece of his argument in which he claims that the distinguishing mark that is necessary for inner reflection is the same as the word in language, right? So there's, there's no sense in which the word is just an addition to what you would normally be using in, in your perception, right? It's not as if you have reflection and then you add words in order to communicate. He's saying that those words, in fact, are essential for this very process of reflection. So thus, through a distinguishing mark, and what was that other than a distinguishing word within? The sound of bleeding perceived by a human soul as the distinguishing mark of the sheep became, by virtue of this reflection, the name of the sheep, even if his tongue had never tried to stammer it. Right? So that and this is the point where, and I guess you could say that this is evidence, it's a little tricky because he's, he's not actually pointing to an actual bleeding sheep, but he's, um, he's imagining, he's, he's asking us to imagine this bleeding and, and imagine how the sound of the bleeding perceived by the, uh, by the human then becomes the word for the sheep. Even his tongue had never tried to stammer, and that's the key. That Wor the words of language are the markers that allow for reflection even before you even say the word, even before it's used as a form of communication. So he's saying that somehow these, these words exist as words even if you don't say them as a word of, that's used as communication. Right? And then so, so that leads in this claim, he recognized the sheep by its bleeding this was a conceived sign through which the soul clearly remembered an idea. And what is that other than a word? And what is the entire human language other than a collection of such words? So it's, you know, so the claim here is, right, the distinguishing mark that's necessary for inner reflection is the same as the word in language. And it's a little tricky because he does say, he does say that um, this was a conceived sign through which the soul clearly remembered an idea. And so it's not clear, well, could there be an idea without the word? And he says, what is that other than a word? He's saying really that that idea and the word, they're really the same thing. Well, okay, well, <coughs> let's look at the evidence here to, for, for why he says that. He continues, even if the occasion were never to rise for him, that he should want to or be able to, want or be able to transmit this idea to another being and thus to bleat out with his lips this distinguishing mark of reflection for another, his soul, as it were, bleated within when it selected this sound as a sign of recollection and it bleated again as it recognized the sound by its sign. So again, he's, he's kind of pointing to evidence, again, but it's, it's kind of strange evidence in the sense that it, it, he's also, again, asking us to imagine this this scene of the sheep in our minds, and, and here it's, it's more difficult because he's really leading us to imagine this, how this bleeding is selected as a, as a sign of recollection and as this sound of a sign. So that there's, there's a, you know, he's saying that this bleeding happens in the mind as a kind of word, even when you're not speaking, and even when you're just imagining the sheep, 
right, as an idea. So here, it's, I would say that he's kind of merging his evidence with his warrant, right? Because he's, if this is really, it's not really something that, if you, if you kind of imagine this bleeding sheep, you're not really sure that that's an idea that's at the same time a word, or maybe two separate things, that there's, a, there's an, an idea of the sheep, and then there's a word for sheep, right? He's kind of pointing to that as evidence, but I would say that's not really evidence. That's just, that's really his warrant. And, and he says this at, in, the, in the next sentence, he's got language has been invented, invented as naturally and to man as necessarily, uh, wait, invented as naturally and to man as necessarily as man was man, right? So he's saying that, <coughs> that the human mind needs language, right? That, <coughs> that it's necessary to man to function as uh, a human being that has reflection. And so that seems to be the warrant. That seems to be he's, he's, he's really assuming that we, that we can't function within our minds to have these ideas of things without language as a set of words. He's giving that to us as a kind of evidence, but I think it's really functioning more like a warrant in the sense that he doesn't really, I don't think he's really proved to us that, we, that, that the ideas that we have in our mind of things are necessarily the consequence of the words that we have for things, right? Because it, you can kind of imagine in your mind the sheep without actually somehow saying the word for sheep. Does that mean we're using these ideas without the word? Well, maybe, but maybe, you know, the other case would be maybe we're, we had the word sheep before, and that's how we even have this idea of sheep in our minds. But it's not something that he's really, I think, able to demonstrate here. It's really something um, that he's providing to us as, as a kind of, of warrant for what he's saying. Okay? Uh, even though I think he does demonstrate the way in which the human mind does need some kind of distinguishing marks. It's, not, it's just not clear what the, whether those distinguishing marks have to be constructed as a, a separate human language.